Uh, without further ado, it's time to introduce um, uh, Josh Quick. Um, Josh is a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at the University of Birmingham, also where I am. And uh, Josh, uh, for the last, uh, since January, has been working on um, sequencing methods uh, for uh, the reliable and robust sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, having invented, um, I think, the most popular method of sequencing uh, coronavirus uh, genomes. So uh, I will not spoil any more of his talk and pass you over uh, to Josh for the next uh, part. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for the introduction, Nick. Um, okay. Is that showing the right screen or is that the wrong one? <laughs> uh, it's, we're just seeing the still seeing the view rather than the slide view. Um, let's go back to it and then switch them. Is, is that one the same? Still just seeing the PowerPoint view. Which is okay to be honest. You could just use that and scroll through, but uh... um, I'll just unplug my display a second so it just goes back to this one. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, well, thanks for uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to give you a talk about uh, about the Arctic protocol and how you can use it to sequence COVID nineteen. So there's a uh, there's a couple of basic uh, concepts I want to introduce first. So the the reasons that we have just so the the Arctic Protocol is uh, is combines amplicon amplicon sequencing um, and nanopore sequencing. So the and the reason that we use uh, those two two concepts is because we want it to be really sensitive and we want it to be really fast. So th those are the the main. Um, the main reasons for doing it. There are lots of considerations um, which you need to take into account when you're deciding well, what's the best sequencing protocol for you. But um, nanopore sequencing is great for uh, when you're looking for a fast time to answer, obviously because it's a, a, a real-time sequencer, you can, you can look at the data as it's, as it's generated. It's, it's relatively cheap, although when you're comparing costs you have to take into account the number of samples and the and the instrument and all that kind of thing um, but it's it's very robust and easy um, however one of the downsides is there is a contamination risk as as, as there is with all amplicon sequencing approaches so that's something you need to be very careful of um, and portability is, is very good um, suitable for up to 96 samples uh, per flow cell um, or more if you're doing washing but i'll come back to that so those are the sort of broad considerations. And then in terms of sample suitability, uh, I've tried to, so this card, this is, a, this is a, a histogram here showing some, showing the distribution of CT values for a, for a diagnostic assay. Uh, this one's actually for Zika. But if you, if you consider that um, your qPCR test is going to, is going to call anything positive that, that has a CT value, a cycle threshold below 40, and uh, I am aware of the fact that, um, oh, why is it doing that? I am aware of the fact that CT isn't the best uh, measure of viral load. This probably, you know, with a calibration curve, converting it to copies per, per mil is, is a much better method, but most people use cycle thresholds. So that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, anything below 40 will be called as a, as a positive by QR, QRT-PCR, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can sequence that. That really only means that you had a fragment of the target uh, in the worst possible scenario it means you had one copy of the target um, if the, of the um, of the Q, of the qpcr assay um, if we want to sequence it we need to have the whole genome present in fragments and with pcr amplification you have a good chance you have a very good chance of of recovering that but it re realistically means that the that the, um, the 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 limit for Genome sequencing successfully is is around CT thirty three uh, in practice is, is what we is what we see, um, and then there are other methods such as bait capture, 
RNA seq and direct RNA, and I've I've sort of estimated where I think those would fall if you were if you were to consider how many samples out of a given outbreak you would be able to sequence with these with these methods. So so amplicon sequencing is 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 good for sequence. Um, is good for them for you know for the, for a large majority of the samples you might encounter. Another another important um, concept is the idea of long read sequencing and short read sequencing. And short read sequencing comes in two uh, types: single uh, single end and paired end, where you're sequencing either from one end or from both ends. Um, and then there's also um, the and then there's also the same thing with fragmentation. So with nanopore sequencing. If you have long or short amplicons, it doesn't really matter because you can put any any fragment length into the uh, into the um, into the sequencer, and you will generate one amplicon read from one end to the other. With aluminum sequencing or iron torrent sequencing, you have uh, either SBS or flow based chemistries. You need you need to make sure that your amplicon is compatible with your read length of your sequencing chemistry, and that either means that you need to define you need to figure out what's your maximum. Um, paired end read length to make sure that you can overlap a, an amplicon so you generate the whole sequence of it once you've sequenced both reads. Or that might mean that if you have long amplicons, you need to do some kind of fragmentation, which is the situation on the right hand side. So we're, we're, because we're doing nanopore sequencing here, we're only really thinking about the, 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 the situation on the left, but there are a lot of people who prefer to take Arctic amplicon uh, to the piece, take the PCR step from the beginning of the Arctic process and then put it into other technologies, either either you know iron torrent or um, or alumina, with either um, either paired end sequencing or fragment or fragmented paired end sequencing, for example, Nextera. So this is something some some concepts that are, are important. So as I said, we use PCR amplification. It's a, an exponential amplification process, and it's it's very simple. It's very robust, and it's been around for a long time. Um, so that's so that's one of the advantages of doing something like this. It provides you inbuilt enrichment because the material that's uh, so any host material that was in your sample is going to be is going to be dramatically swamped because of the um, amplification of the target uh, fragments. And we came up with this um, this approach uh, back in 2017 during the 2016-2017 um, during the Zika outbreak, and we we were trying to sequence a very large number of of very difficult to sequence samples with Zika virus. Um, and we came up with the, uh, the, the approach of using multiplex PCR, which is, which is based on similar approaches that were already in existence at the time, like, uh, like for example, thermo, thermo AmpliSeq. But um, this was completely, um, but this was, it was designed uh, all the primers and everything were designed from script and the, and the processes were, were designed um, again using open source components so the we we were what we decided to do for 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 the zika for zika protocol was to do um to 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 use multiplex pcr because you don't have very much sample and obviously the more sub pcr reactions you do singleplex pcr reactions you do the more sample you need so it's quite efficient in the sense that you're doing multiple reactions in the same in the same tube but that means you need to make all the reactions work in the same tube so that's that's really the key of this and we define we we define the parameters in these early stages um, for this seeker uh, project and it was and it was successful and what you actually end up with is in two reactions generating coverage um, at the top here, this is the unnormalized coverage, and this is the normalized coverage. And the main thing to, to note here is that you get the amplicons overlap, so you end up with more coverage at the overlap points. And then occasionally you see the, you know, you see dropouts, which is why you, why there's no coverage there. And then we can normalize it to 200x, for example, using the Arctic pipeline, um, which is good because it, it 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 means that you're not analyzing unnecessary amounts of data, which aren't going to improve the call of that position. Um, so we so after that we did we uh, we made a web interface so that we the, the the key thing I said before was that the primers have to work in the same reaction together and that means that they have to have to be of the correct um, specification in, in terms of the thermodynamics of the primers like TM like if anyone's ever designed PCR primers before um, 
all the TMs have to be very similar, all the product lengths have to be very similar, but and then all the and we have to check for interactions between them, such as um, home, such as homodimers or heterodimer products, which are going to form dimers in a reaction. So we uh, we produced a, a piece of software called Primal Scheme, and then eventually a web interface. Um, and this is what it looks like. So you basically put in your FASTA file, um, and it will sort of scan through the genome looking for primers which um, overlap uh, for each region that overlap the last region, um, picking the best the best uh, primers from each region, and outputting that as a as a as a bed file and a TS or a TSV file, um, which means that you can order your primers um, from your oligo supplier and then pull them together into two pools, one and two, so that you can do the two reactions, the two pools being above the line and below the line. It's basically the odd reactions and the even reactions. And the reason that you have to do two reactions is because you can't put them together um, because they're, uh, because they, they have, a, they have, because of that overlap, you would form an overlap product between, between right and the left. So you need to uh, have them in two separate reactions. So moving um, a bit more up to date, back in um, back in January 2020, um, uh, the the first um, this, the first genome um, for SARS-CoV-2, uh, which at the time wasn't wasn't named wasn't named that, uh, was was published by Fudan University, uh, and it was originally. If you look at the GenBank record here, you can see it was originally published on the 5th of January, um, and then it was uh, updated. On the um, on the seventeenth of January, and uh, and I downloaded that genome and started putting together a primer set and a protocol, and came up with uh, the uh, uh, came up with this, which we published on protocols.io. So this was the first version of the Arctic uh, NCOV twenty nineteen, as we called it, protocol, which was published on the twenty second twenty second of January. So. Um, so that, because we had all these, uh, we'd previously been, as you can see here, this was forked from an Ebola virus sequencing protocol, which, which we've been previously, which we've been using the previous December. So using this tool, protocols.io, you're able to fork existing protocols, update them, and then, and then publish them again as separate protocols. So that was one way you can reuse, um, reuse the, 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 the resources that we already had. And, um, and I was, we didn't actually uh, even test uh, the primers when, 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 I, when we put this online. We just, we just had an assumption that it would work because we'd done so many other virus schemes before this. Um, and, um, and that was largely true, but we did, we did make, need to make some um, updates to it. We didn't realize quite how popular it was going to be, um, but, that was, but, that came, but that came a lot later. Uh, so there's been quite a few updates to the... Um, the, the primer the primer scheme we've done version two which was very short-lived and then version three uh, where um, which was actually in use for a long time nearly nearly, nearly 14 or 15 months um, and that was basically the set that was was based was similar to v1 but we had where there was where there was regions of, of weak amplification, we had added in alternate primers, basically slightly shifted to the left or the right to uh, improve the coverage at those positions, and that was worked on with John Tyson um, uh, at, at the uh, at UBC at that time. And um, and you can see that for this is a this is a type a zero dilution of in, of positive control material, um, and you can see that as you if you use very, if you use the higher input sample, you can achieve. Um, this is this is a, a genome coverage on the y-axis and read number on the, on the uh, x-axis, and you can see that as you um, increase the number of reads that you have, you achieve a maximum coverage of uh, you know ninety nine point six, which is whatever this this uh, primer scheme, the maximum this primer scheme allows because there's small regions at the ends, and as you as you reduce the input, that drops down. So the the perfect scheme. You would you would have um, full coverage with very few reads, and that would drop off very little as you as you decrease the input. You can see that there was a nice improvement from V1 to V3, where we were able to um, improve the number of and the number of titration points at which you can achieve maximum coverage. And and uh, we've done even better than this now, and I think we'll come back to that at the end. So as well as the primer 
uh, improvements. We also made some changes to the protocol itself. Um, so uh, we changed quite a few things in the in the protocol itself. One to remove the post PCR cleanup to speed it up. So some streamlining things, uh, change some of the reagents to make them cheaper, um, and also um, investigated whether or not you could wash and reuse the flow cell. And around this time also, Nanopore released a 96 barcode version of the, net, of the native barcoding kit, which, um, which, was a, which was a big improvement because the pre previous to the, uh, you know, previous to this, they only had the 24 plex kit. And if you, if you look at this plot on the right, this basically shows for the Flongor, the Minine and the Promethine flow cells um, with um, the low cost protocol, which is the triangles, um, which is the the, the, the the latest version of the protocol, you can see that um, with either 12, 24, um, 48 or 96 barcodes, and then either zero or one, two, three washes, the sort of numbers of, um, this is a cost model, the number of uh, the amount, the, the cost per sample that, that, that you would achieve. And this sort of plateaus out and that's because the library cost becomes predominant over the flow cell cost at a certain point. But basically with the 96 flow cell, um, with the 96 barcode kit on a minine flow cell, you can achieve, with zero washes, you can achieve somewhere around 12 or 13 pounds or for 48, somewhere around um, sort of 17, 18 pounds, I think that is. Um, yeah, so, so quite cost effective. And then during the, during, um, during uh, so since the version one primers and then after the version two and three versions were released, they updated this paper, but a group in Japan looked into the dimer products and they actually sequenced the dimer products on Illumina um, to try and figure out what were, what was causing them. In, and what they've discovered was that the, um, there, was a, there was interactions within some of the primer pairs um, that were forming um, that were that sort of interesting because they were all, well, they all had something in common, which was that they were interactions, but they were specifically interactions with with three prime stability. So you can have you can have interactions between primers that occur in the middle, um, you know, or or occur near near one end, but and they can be very very stable in the sense of of their of their annealing temperature, but they don't seem to matter unless the they have a very uh, they have a an, a very as, and, unless they have a three prime exact match. Um, and all of these are basically like that. You can see that there's one down here where you have a, a, a mismatch that's one base away from the three prime end, but, but ultimately all of them have um, share this in common. And this told us that this was the kind that we could, that we needed to look for interactions of this type. And even <clears throat> if the interactions were, um, had, a, had, a, had a, a higher melting temperature, that were in the middle of the primers, they 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 could be filtered out and ignored because really it was only these specific ones that we should that we should uh, look at. So actually change the pro uh, change the software, take this into account um, uh, last year, and that's definitely made a big improvement. And then, as as we talked about the with the um, this the original version one scheme was designed with just the just the original um, Wuhan genome uh, on for the design but since then has accumulated uh, a, a lot of mutations and if you look at this plot at the bottom here where i've taken um the canonical mutations in in all these different lineages and, and shown them um shown them by these marks um you can see that there are some regions which are now contain you know very, a lot of high frequency mutations for example in this region here which is a spike protein you can see there's a um there's a very large frequency of mutations there, and some of those are those, some of those are deletions, and that has an effect on the primer schemes on the effectiveness of the primers. So, for example, here this is version on the left here in pink. This is a, a ramp-up plot showing what happens if you sequence a delta variant sample using V3 primers, and you can see that there's one, two, three uh, almost complete dropouts um, where there's uh, less than 20x coverage, which is what we need for the um, uh, for the pipeline, and I mean, this is only twenty six thousand reads, but you can see that these two are never going to recover that because we've got no no reads over twenty six out twenty six thousand. Uh, this this region um, is has reduced efficiency, but it's probably still going to work. Um, so we took all of this 
all of these uh, uh, genomes as, as an input data source and then made a new scheme, which is now called V4, which we're currently rolling out. Um, and this is actually old data, but it's the only one that I have, um, but it's the, it's the one that I have to hand, um, showing V4 primers uh, and how they've addressed this, these, these dropout regions in, um, in, uh, in, this, in this, for a Delta variant. You can see that, that you know, across the spike, we have complete coverage uh, over 20x. We've actually fixed these um, lower regions now uh, as well, uh, which were caused by uh, interactions where there was mismatches um, which weren't being, which meant they weren't being detected. So, um, so that's that's basically. Some people call this primer erosion, but it's basically where your your primers um, are, get uh, become inefficient, become inefficient or or, or non functional due to mutations or deletions in the in the in the, in the, in the binding sites. So that's something that we have to keep on top of by changing them uh, periodically. But um, the, uh, so the but overall the art it's been you know far more successful than than we you know than we would ever have imagined um, to the point where that um, we now have collaborations with IDT who manufacture the primer pools as a, and sell the primer pools uh, to people directly which means they don't have to buy all of the stock tubes and pull them together which saves people time um, uh, and money and uh, we also have a um, there's now also a Netnex Arctic kit. Which is um, which which basically kitifies all of the individual components that you need for the nanopore. They also have an aluminum version as well, but for the nanopore um, native barcoding protocol, which includes the primers and all the enzymes, which means that you don't have to buy lots of individual part numbers. You can just buy the, um, the companion kit, and that's only one part number, and you'll have everything you need. And that also comes with balanced primers um, for V3. Um, so that so that's going to need updating for um, for uh, V4. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the lab in a suitcase, and these these um, very neatly packed bags um, are the ones that um, Ian and um, myself packed for um, a trip to uh, the DRC um, to go to the uh, INRB in Kinshasa, and this is all. All of the equipment in those four bags that's required to set up um, a mobile lab with containment for pre and post PCR and um, I'll show you how that works. So Ian and Luke Meredith devised this system um, where you have um, um, a pre PCR, um, a sample addition, a sa an extraction sample addition and a master mix cabinet that are all um, up, which are which are all up, um, contained areas using um, hydroponics tents from Amazon that have been modified. Uh, and each of them has an individual, um, a, a separate set of pipettes and, and labware, which, do, which, which means that they, you know, nothing has to go between these, these cabinets. And that allows you to do, um, to control contamination, working with, amp you know, working with amplicon sequencing, even when you're in the field. So this is still quite portable, it's still, it's relatively big with the four bags, but it's, it's certainly it's certainly manageable. And um, and this is what it looked like in um, when it was set up at the INRB in Kinshasa in a single room with a, with a dedicated um, chair and lab and lab coat you can see for each of the areas. And then um, and this this is what um, what Eddie and his team moved this into uh, moved this to. Uh, Goma, which was closer to the to the to the um, to the epicenter of the outbreak, and reset it up there, and that's what it looked like there. Uh, and this is just a photo that we took with uh, the legend JJ Mwembe. It's actually the guy that discovered Ebola, and he came to visit the lab. Um, and so, lastly, the last thing I want to uh, talk about is um, is Rampart. So, uh, what's going on here? So the, um, the Rampart is a program which um, James Hadfield um, um, produced, which shows you real-time coverage of all the samples that you're uh, sequencing on your run. So this is an, um, and some Ebola uh, data here, but you can see that um, this is going to do the demultiplexing and the and the mapping of the reads in the in the background and show you what the coverage over the over, over the genome is, the read length. And um, a collector's curve of the um, of the run progress for each of the samples that are on your run, so you can see um, 
whether or not they have sufficient coverage that you can stop the run. And this is also um, a few other sort of overall, uh, a few of, of the overview plots here showing all of the coverage overlaid, reads collect the read collection from the run, um, and also the number of reads for each barcode. So it's a useful software um, for monitoring runs if you're um, if you're you know if you're or if you're a lab type person, you just want to get a really quick view of what it looks like. Okay, so that is the um, end of the presentation. Um, obviously, the this is a I've presented quite a lot of um, work from the Arctic Network, and these are all of the Arctic Network and our collaborators. So, um, thank you to all of them, and thanks for all, to you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you um, very much for that. It's a really uh, useful overview of um, how to get set up with, with sequencing. Um, some really good questions. Oh, thanks for the uh, virtual applause there. Um, so good questions in, in the chat. So we'll just take those uh, one at a time. I think we've got lots of time. Um, so firstly, from Phil Ashton, um, first question is, so does Primal Scheme work for every virus? Um, and have you ever had it uh, to be unable to find a good scheme? And, and maybe at the same time, can you answer the question, just explain why you have to have two pools again? I might, might have missed that. Um, so you have, to have, you have to have two pools because they, each of the um, neighboring amplicons overlap slightly. And if you, if you, if you put those if you put those two primers in together, they would preferentially form the overlap product rather than the full length amplicon. So that's basically just because PCR is more efficient on shorter fragments, uh, on shorter targets. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it likely would work quite poorly if you did it on, in a single tube, but you might get some, some results. Um, and does Primal Scheme work on all viruses? Was that the, other, was that the question? That's right. Yeah. Oh, unable to find a good scheme. Ever fail. So, so there's two there's two ways of so it, it's looking for for concert, for regions of cons conservation to be able to design primers, and you can control that using the number of maximum number of mismatches. But yeah, if you have a very diverse group of um, viruses, um, for example, we tried to make a pan Ebola virus scheme before. It's quite difficult. The the way that um, I used to do it is by putting a lot of representative genomes into a file and then using alignment and then trying to find the, um, the, the, the most conserved primers. What we actually now do is, is take a reference genome and mask it at all of the um, variant positions and the program will not output any uh, primers with N bases in. So that's a, a good way of, of preventing a, a, another, a new way that I sort of prefer to run it now. But yeah, if you have, if you have so many masks in the reference genome that there's no positions for any primers then yeah you, you can't you can't do it so really it depends on um on how much how much diversity there is in in the in the scheme that you're trying to make works really well for outbreak strains um and then um it's it's progressively more difficult for sort of bigger and bigger groups of uh, of viruses yeah i mean it's sort of worth emphasizing that isn't it um it really works well for SARS-CoV-2 and one reason for that is that very recent common ancestor, right? You know, it's uh, the, the genomes, there is diversity in the genomes, but only a year and a half's worth of diversity at two SNPs per month, which was what Andrew said. Um, it's much, much harder to take a, a, um, a, a much more diverse virus and make a single scheme, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The Arctic sequencing protocol exists in other languages. It exists in French. Um, uh, but not Spanish, I, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so Miguel, if you're interested in helping translate into Spanish, that would be great. We would be keen on people translating it. We'd say we do have a version in French, um, but we don't, I'm not aware that there's one in Spanish, but uh, um, we have a lot of collaborators in Brazil that have used it. And so there might be a Portuguese one around somewhere. Okay, so um, another question from Phil. For Josh, how how many washes and reruns um, are achievable on a minion flow cell by a typical lab? So, what's quite common? What what people do quite commonly, and I know that um, I know that, that Matt does this. He's on the call in Nottingham. Is he takes uh, forty eight 
takes 48 samples, runs them on the on the on the flow cell to get the data quite quickly, and then washes it and then uses the other 48 barcodes on a second run. Um, and that way you know that you've got no, you haven't actually used the same barcodes twice. So you don't you don't have to worry so much about um, about the how 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 efficiently the nuclease uh, wash has removed the previous library, but we have actually measured the amount of um, of carryover from from library to library, um, and it is it is at the time it was it was um, tolerable, but there was a little bit of variation. Depending, it seemed to be a variation from wash to wash as to how efficient it was. So um, if if it was something that you were confident of that was working very well you could basically use the same 96 again and do two full 96 runs but what we tend to find is that the coverage of the um the yield from the first run um you know it wouldn't be enough to do um the, the yield from this from the second and the third runs wouldn't actually be enough to to sequence of, to get full enough coverage as a full 96 so um, yeah, so we we tend not to do washing. In fact, in Birmingham, we haven't done washing for um, at all through the through the, the whole outbreak, apart from to do these validation runs. Um, some sites have done have done more, um, but we 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 do get overkill. That we we do forty eight samples per minute flow cell, and and at the moment we seem to be averaging about ten to fifteen million reads per per run, which is it's it's good, but it takes. A, quite a long time to generate that data what would be better is if the um is if you could if you know it depends on how quickly you want the turnaround time to be and how big your batch size is so what would be so some people prioritize you know cost and some people prioritize turnaround time so fewer samples run for less time obviously it's quicker uh, but but you might need to do more more at once so it's quite a rambly answer but it's uh, there's lots of different um different priorities really which affect that decision Definitely not a simple equation, is it? Actually, it relates to a question in the chat, which is how many reads do you actually target per sample? Because if you're talking about 10 to 15 million reads per, per run, that's another way of looking at it. So how many samples, how many reads actually per sample are you looking for? So one of the things I look at with, with de when developing the primer scheme is the number of reads to get full coverage. And, um, or you could think about that as, as the CV between the amplicons. Um, and one of the best ways to reduce the amount of reads you need for a sample is to to get rid of any weak regions to try to push those up so that um, so that you, you, you need fewer, fewer reads to achieve the minimum coverage. And with V4 uh, on our test material, it's improved quite a bit uh, in terms of the CV and um, you're able to get full coverage with about 10 to 20,000 reads. So that's that's. A lot better than than V three, and and that should reduce the amount of reads you need overall. The problem with with that is is that you've got um, you've got some within within the run you've got barcodes uh, represent you know you've got different number of reads coming from different barcodes. So some some barcodes might produce ten times more data than other barcodes, and that relates to the sample with the sample because there's no normalization. Um, it's just uh, uh, we just you just dilute it straight out of the PCR. What you tend to find is the lower the CT, the more reads you get for that sample. Um, so, so you don't get an equal number of reads for each sample. Yeah, and just explain what CV is if people don't know what that is. So CV is is the coefficient of variation. So basically the variation between the amplicon coverages. Uh, and really what you want is them to all be identical, but for that to happen, you'd have to have every single reaction primer pair working with the same efficiency which is unrealistic so uh, but minimizing the spread so not having any that are very very efficient and not having very very that are very inefficient okay and and so this kind of relates to another question from miguel which is um the arctic protocol says to run for six hours i guess that might be in the protocol io um is there a benefit for running for longer? Um, and he's saying he has a consistent problem with missing nucleotides, AKA N problems. So I think that this is probably related to what you, to your answer you've just given, but you know, what is the relationship effectively between read the run time and the, you know, the ends in your sample? So the, so yeah, so it's a good question. So we typically run for uh, uh, 20, we do 24 hour runs with, with 48 samples. So. Um, and I think the protocol is written 24 samples minimum for six hours. 
So you could definitely run it for probably 12 hours um, with 24 samples. Uh, but, re but basically what this relates to is the fact that the definition of a dropout and the definition of a dropout is um, is an amplicon which will never which will never come which will never you'll never see uh, no matter how much coverage you get for you know how much data you collect um, and the amount of dropouts that you get will change depending on the viral input as I said earlier so if you have a um, if you have a low CT sample you should see no um, you should see no dropouts because we've validated it uh, we've validated v3 and v4 um, on you know these low inputs to prove that they, that they don't that they should that they shouldn't have dropouts at that at that input level but as you go to as you go to um, higher and higher cts what you tend to see is it sort of stretch and stress the system to the point where what looks quite reasonable for for a higher input suddenly starts dropping lower and lower and lower as you go to the as you go to the higher cts and um, those are the those are what produces what produce the um, uh, what what result in n so n n basically means you don't get sufficient coverage of that region so when you do the consents when you do the um, the consensus based variant calling you end up with n's in the genome because you didn't have coverage um, and that's the reason why um, but but I think you can't say that that's because of the the runtime it could be the runtime but it could also be the amplification efficiency or it could also be the library efficiency. Yeah, it's probably worth pointing out. So, so you mentioned the Rampart software in your talk. Rampart is one way of dealing with this problem, isn't it? Because if you can, on nanopore sequence at least, you can watch the coverage as it comes in, uh, particularly if you're able to base call in real time, um, you, meaning you've got a gridiron or a, maybe a Mark 1C or a good GPU card and a laptop. If you can base call in real time, you can watch the coverage in real time. And so you can decide, you know, for any given experiment, at what point basically have you got sufficient coverage for your samples? Or at what point are you confident that even if you sequence for a lot longer, you're not actually going to get any more coverage because let's say an amplicon has dropped out for one of the reasons that Josh described. So that, that you've got, if you have that more dynamic interactive view of the sequencing, it does help quite a lot. Um, and actually Matt Luce is, um, is on the call. Um, and uh, he also has some software um, which has been around for min for minion sequencing uh, for a while now called Minotaur. Um, and I know that he uses that. Actually, Matt, why don't you just jump in and just um, describe that very briefly, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I just caught you, caught you chatting about that. Yeah, we have this package called Minotaur that we're going to pre-print shortly. Um, it bundles up an Arctic pipeline within it, so it uses the software that will be described a little bit later on, um, and it tracks the Amplicon coverage for samples. Um, and makes a prediction as to whether a sample will finish within a certain period of time. So, so actually it will tell you, um, we, we sometimes run up to, to 94 samples plus controls and it will tell you which of those are likely to complete based on the yield of the flow cell. Um, but then it also goes on to run the Arctic pipeline whilst the sequencing run is in progress on samples that have sufficient coverage uh, and it will do all those you know, fun things like assigned variants and things later on. So we should be getting a preprint up on this shortly uh, if anyone wants to use it. Great. And maybe when that's out, you could come for the next workshop and present that as well. That'd be great. Yeah, or I might get Rory to who's been developing it. Even better. Even better. Okay, there's, I think uh, Josh asked the, answered the question about IDT. Uh, they are working on getting the V4 pools uh, synthesized. Um, so one final question, then we'll move on with, with the remaining two talks um, from uh, Tanat, which is, thank you for these wonderful tools. What is your thought on protocols with larger amplicons, uh, like the Midnight Protocol, which is so cool because it's 1200 base pair protocol rather than 400 bases. So what are your thoughts on those longer amplicon schemes? So there's so the long Rampicon schemes should give um, should give more complete genome coverage because they're less susceptible, they have less in, less primers, less interactions, and less susceptible to um, to dropouts. But they will be better on higher um, 
with you know they'll be better they'll be better with you know l lower uh, CT samples um, and more intact RNA samples. So you really need to have you need, really need to have very high quality RNA to use a twelve hundred base pair scheme. Um, we we use the v, we stick with four hundred base pair uh, partly because it's compatible with Illumina and Nanopore, but also because it works on uh, degraded RNA quite well and um, and higher CTs. So um, so yeah, so twelve hundred. You have to just consider the library prep. It work, will work on Nanopore with full length, but if you're doing it on Illumina, you'll need some kind of fragmentation for that. I've, I'm afraid I've got to go because I've got another talk now. But um, perfect. All right. Um, Thank you so much, Josh. See you yeah. later. Cheers, then. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Okay. Um, there was a question. I can probably try and answer. Is there a role for adding a third PCR pool to enrich the areas with dropouts and spike? Certainly something that um, I know Josh has thought about the idea of adding um, more pools, you know, four pools, six pools, eight pools. I don't think there's a scheme like that available. Something you could probably do is actually do the V3 scheme and the V4 scheme or the midnight scheme and the V4 scheme separately and then effectively uh, combine that data uh, to try and reduce the risk of dropouts in spike. That might be a thing if you're really, really keen to, to get coverage, uh, something you could do. 